Ruchma Boim. Again, welcome to our home. Again, thank you for attending. So this week, on my thoughts, <clears throat> the lecture that I'm doing this week is called What Can We Learn <clears throat> From Having Children? So this week on my thoughts, I'd, I'd like to examine why it is, interestingly enough, that the first commandment in the Torah that was given to mankind in Genesis was Peru Urvu, which means to be fruitful and to multiply. And then the verse continues with the Hebrew words, umilo aoretz, es aoretz, and populate the land. So I find this command interesting in that it does not mention anything about marriage. It just refers to procreation, having children. In addition, this command was given to Adam, first man, before, even before Chava, the first woman that was created. So, from the wording of the verse, we observe that when Adam, first man, was created, the Torah states that Bara Oso Zohar Nekeva, Osam, that he, he, cre he created them, okay, male and female. So, in reality, Adam was one side male, the other side female. It was only in the next verse where God said, Lo Tov Hayos Adam Levado, that it is not good for a man to be alone. And that is when God divided both parts of man into two separate entities, one of a man and the other of a woman. So logically speaking, it would have made much more sense for God to first state that it was, wasn't good for a man to be alone, and only after creating a mate for him, the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with children. Now, whether we are referring to a Jew or a non-Jew, God Almighty commands us to bear children through matrimony. Bearing children out of wedlock is really not a godly act. Marriage is seen as a sacred union between a man and a woman, what we refer to in Hebrew as Kedushin. This word is taken from the Hebrew word Kedusha, which means to sanctify. So God Almighty views marriage as a key in sustaining our world as we know it. However, based on the way that the command reads, all that God is commanding us is to populate the world. Again, there's no mention of matrimony. Well, the question is, but why not? So I believe that it is not an accident that the first command that God placed in his Torah was peru or vu, to be fruitful and multiply. But the wording allows us to learn different lessons that are important in our daily lives. On a simple level, of course, there can be no doubt that the command was about bringing children into this world. The reason given was that God created a world and he wanted mankind to populate all of his world. Now, we view in the aftermath of the flood that was brought on the world that after the flood, all of mankind congregated together in the Iraqi basin. The Torah tells us that it was there that they built the Tower of Bubble. It was then that God, in the portion of Noah, decided, the Yafet Hashem Osam Misham that God dispersed them from there, meaning he separated them into the 70 root nations, each with their own land, land and their own language. There are those commentaries that state that this dispersion was actually a form of punishment. However, there are others that state that God was really just fulfilling his original command to Adam, which was umilosa oretz, to populate the earth. So by bearing children, we are, in essence, following the original blueprint that God Almighty drew up when he first created his world. Now, the words being fruitful and multiply can also be seen as a command by God, our benevolent Father in heaven, for us to grow as individuals. Who we are is really not good enough. There can be no doubt that bearing children is essential for the survival and continuity of our world. However, bringing up children is also an essential ingredient in promoting our own personal growth. As the saying goes, more than we bring up our children, we bring up ourselves. Having children compels us to look into the mirror and to take an honest assessment of who and what we really are. It doesn't really allow us much wiggle room. It forces us to ask ourselves the tough question. Do we want our children to grow up to be, pardon me, to be a reflection of who we are now? Or do we need to push ourselves past our comfort zone so that we can be the role model that our children need 
and they deserve. I find it interesting that many young married couples begin having their children in their 20s. You know, in your 20s, you may be physically mature. So to speak, the cement has already been poured. However, when it comes to personal maturity, well, the cement hasn't cured yet. You still have the ability to grow. I believe that the older we get, well, the more dogmatic we become. This may be the reason why God orchestrated that babies should have babies. It is through our children that we are forced to grow, to adopt values that have substance versus the frivolous pleasures of youth. You know, it wasn't until my son was born that I personally took an honest look at myself in the mirror. And I asked myself that question. If my son grows up to be me, will that be good enough? The answer was no. That being the case, I began to reassess my previous lifestyle. With no other alternative, I then turned to God, who had blessed me with a son, and I became an Orthodox Jew. I can honestly say that without my son being born, I'm certain that I would not have become the person that I am today. There are many important lessons that we learn by being a parent, such as bittel, which means total self-nullification. You know, before we have children, we may be selfish, self-centered individuals. However, once we have a child, we experience what it is to become a, a true giver and the joy that it generates. As the saying goes, giving is its own reward. You know, we love our children even before they are born. We actually love our children many times even more than we love ourselves. Children are demanding. They want everything and they want it now. They resemble Adam, first man before he sinned by eating from the tree of knowledge. Before he ate, everything that he wanted was his immediately. He did not have to wait, not wait for anything. However, after he sinned, well, his world changed drastically, and he was then compelled to learn patience. Our job as parents is to teach our children patience. While at the same time that we are teaching them, we are also learning the same lesson ourselves. You know, without pa patience, child rearing is impossible. If a parent thinks that their child will learn a lesson with minimal instruction and guidance, well, <laughs> they're in for a rude awakening. Perseverance and patience are necessities for successful parenting and for a happy life. You know, being a role model is another trait that bringing of children forces us to adopt. Whether we like it or not, telling a child, do as I say and not as I do, doesn't work. Your children are watching and listening to everything that you do or say, especially to those things that you don't want them to see or hear. They are looking for the truth, but at the same time, they are looking for loopholes. You know, they are observing the shortcuts that you take. As the saying goes, if you can talk the talk, then you must walk the walk. You can't fool your children into doing what it is proper with just words. They are much more interested in your actions. They are generally not going to put forth any more effort than you have. Compassion. Hearing your child laugh is paradise. Seeing them cry is torture. In order to gain a true understanding of who they really are, not who we want them to be, we need to listen to their words. Children are not born as a blank piece of paper that you can write down whatever you want. They are born with a personality. We should carry that compassion into our daily, daily interpersonal relationships as well. You know, an interesting law in Judaism is that a person can, cannot be a judge unless he has had children. Bringing up children teaches us compassion. You know, I remember my wife and I, before we had our own children, we were looking at other parents and wondering, how could they allow their children to do such and such? <laughs> but then, when we had our own children, then we understood perfectly. It is just not that simple. You know, prayer goes hand in hand with parenting. I find it interesting that little babies that are happy, more often than not, grow up to be happier adults. And those babies that cry and complain constantly are prone to do so even as adults. Our job as parents is to help them overcome the challenges that they are born with. Helping them to do so will many times help us 
to overcome those same challenges in our lives that we too have not yet overcome. You know, we read in the Torah about Yitzhak Avinu, Isaac, our father, and his relationship with his wayward son, Esau. Who our children are, it's not an accident. God Almighty has given us our children specifically for us to grow. Yitzhak was compelled to display patience and understanding by keeping his son Esau close. Yitzhak, whose trait was gvura, severity, was the toughest of all the forefathers. He could have easily thrown Esau out of his house, yet he did not. He understood that Esau was given to him by God Almighty as a challenge, a challenge so that he, Yitzchak, could grow. You know, we read in the Torah about the woman called the Sota, the woman who was accused by her husband of infidelity. She has secluded herself with another man after being warned by her husband not to do so. Her jealous husband brings her to the temple where she drinks from we call the May Sota, the bitter water. If she had sinned with the other man, well, she would die a horrible death. However, she was innocent. The Torah states that she would be blessed, blessed with a beautiful son. Now, the previous relationship that this couple shared was far from perfect. It is God Almighty's hope that by blessing them with a son, that it will reignite the spark in their relationship so they can once again be happy with each other. We witness that God Almighty views children as the conduit to which a, ch a couple can once again be reunited in love. I don't think that it's coincidental that the first commandment given to mankind is also a major bone of contention in both the secular and religious worlds. Somehow it is always a front burner issue in many political elections. Whether a candidate is pro-life or anti-life has swayed elections. The Torah's position is really very clear. It even prohibits the neutering of any animal. But the question still remains, why all this concern about bearing children? The Talmud in the Tractate of Yevomot states that Ein ben David ba ad shiokulu kol haneshomos mehaguf, that the son of David, the Messiah, will not come until the, all the souls separate from the body. So what exactly does that mean? So our sages tell us that everything in creation was created at exactly the same moment of creation. Then with each successive day, God Almighty placed everything into their proper place. So to all the souls that would ever be born into this world were actually created at that first moment of creation. The Talmud tells us that one of the ways for us to bring the Messiah is to use up all of those souls in the storage chamber which is called goof. Once all of those souls are born, well, then the Messiah must come. Therefore, it is imperative that the side of evil create a strong opposition to the institution of marriage and having children. However, if couples do decide to marry, then it becomes his job to convince them not to have any children. But if they do have children, then he tries to convince them that they should at least limit the number of children that they will bring into this world. We really need to learn from the side of evil. He takes whatever wins that he can take now, then he just keeps coming. He never runs out of gas. You know, there's a great deal that we can learn by watching how our children act and interact with their peers. Children are happy, they are always busy, and they cry until they get what they want, and they never give up. Interestingly enough, they don't carry grudges. Hmm. You can observe two children arguing with one another, and then moments later, they are the best of friends again. Learn from a child. Great role models. I would be remiss if I didn't mention two important words that both we and our children need to embrace. They are essential for us to attain success in both the secular and spiritual worlds. They are self-confidence and love. Without these two ingredients, success in any arena of life is difficult, if not impossible, to attain. It begins with the belief and a feeling of love of God Almighty, our benevolent Father in Heaven. This forms the basis of who and what we are, and who and what we will be. If you don't believe in yourself, well, then others will find it difficult to believe in you as well. 
Confidence, not conceit. Confidence is a positive trait, a magnet that draws other people to you. Conceit, on the other hand, is a negative trait that puts a rift between you and those individuals that you come in contact with. You know, every child needs to know that you believe in them, that you believe that they can reach and even exceed your expectations. There's a reason why we bless our sons on Friday night with the blessing that Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, blessed his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He said, Ephraim and that good God should bless you to be like Ephraim and Manasseh. Two children who not only reached their potential, they exceeded it. They did so by becoming two of the 12 tribes of Israel. However, it is our job as parents to tailor our expectations to the abilities of each of our children. As it states in Pirkei Avot, the ethics of the father, and as I said, that one good deed brings on another, and one transgression again brings on another. In order for a person to succeed in life, they must believe that they can succeed. There's a saying that goes that if you believe that you will lose, well, then you have already lost. We must encourage our children to take on challenges that are within their capabilities. Once they've tasted they taste of even a small amount of success, they will be motivated to strive for more. Now, it's similar to eating. If you take small bites and chew well, well, your digestive tract will thank you. But if you take big bites and forget to chew, your body will suffer the consequences. You know, I saw this video recently on YouTube. Show me Gavril, spelled G-A-V-R-I-L, Gavril, 1.5. In it, a very young child is seen playing the piano with all of his chubby fingers. He is only a year and a half old, and he is playing with both hands. That, of course, is a gift from God. However, without a piano and a parent to place him on the piano, he could have gone through his, out his whole life and not realize that he had an amazing talent. We need to supply our children with possibilities and allow them to produce the probabilities. So too with ourselves. We need to be willing to expand our, to our horizons. We need to grow. Our sages tell us that the beginning is always connected to the end. The first mitzvah commandment found in the Torah is Peru again to bear children. The last commandment in the Torah is written in the portion of Ayala, where it states, <clears throat> Kis lachem, write for yourself the mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah. The Talmud in Sanhedrin states that from this verse we learn the commandment that every Jew, every Jew is commanded to write a Torah scroll. These two mitzvot allude to the purpose of man, which is to bring children into this world and then to teach them in the ways of Torah and Avodat Hashem. Of serving God. Another thought connected to the words peru or vu, fruitful and multiply, is in reference to Torah study. Our sages tell us that this mitzvah is not just stated in connection with physicality, it is also an allusion to spirituality. They see these words as alluding to Torah study, that if one studies Torah properly, they should give birth to new and innovative ideas that increase their knowledge and understanding. You know, I believe that before God Almighty sends one of his precious diamonds into this world, that he first sends two spies, our parents, who precede them. Their job is to reconnoiter this world. It is their mission to gain as much knowledge and wisdom as possible about life, and then to instruct their children on how to best live it. This is done in the hope that they will be able to use what they have learned to guide and direct God's children in the proper path of Torah and mitzvot. You know, just like it's our greatest wish that our children should mature into proper and respectable human beings, people who love God and earn our admiration and the admiration of their peers, so too, God Almighty, our benevolent Father in Heaven, wishes that we too, His beloved children, should succeed in not only perfecting ourselves, but also helping to polish His diamonds that He has placed into our care. So what do we learn from bringing up our children? First and foremost, to believe in and love God Almighty. In addition, we learn bitter, self-nullification, humility, patience, compassion, and compromise. 
All of these traits are necessary for us and our children to live a happy and productive and satisfying life on this earth. With the added benefit of us earning our reward in the world to come, together with God Almighty, our loving Father in Heaven. And with that, let us offer a pray, prayer to God, our Father in Heaven, that he ends the war in Gaza with the complete destruction of Hamas and all of their confederates. May he return all the hostages safely, cure all of those who are injured and sick, comfort the mourners, and bring home those brave IDF soldiers together with Mashiach Sikana, quickly and in our time. Now, it is time. Again, let me thank you for attending, for listening. Again, I hope that this has meant something to you and you've gleaned from it. Again, may God bless you and yours with all that is good. Be safe, be happy, be healthy. And um, again, we wish you a good Shabbat. Please, uh, if you haven't, um, if you will, subscribe, push the like button, and please share with your friends. Again, let me also mention that after this lecture, right afterwards, there will be a musical rendition. Please stand by. God bless and be well. Thank you for attending.